One can, on very rare occasions, understand the impersonal energy that is emanating from you. But to understand you as you are, it's only by your grace. And that grace comes in reciprocation to devotional service or bhakti. Krishna says the same thing in Gita. Bhaktiya tvana niyashakya aham evam vidurjana. It's only by bhakti that I can be understood as I am standing before you. Because Krishna is unlimited. The limited can never understand the unlimited by its own resources or powers. But the unlimited can reveal himself unlimitedly to the limited by his unlimited potency. I'll try to, re I'll try to repeat that. <laughs> The limited has no capacity to accommodate the unlimited. Yes? It's like, can you put all the water in the Arabian Sea in a teaspoon? What do you say? How much water can fit in a teaspoon? At one time, a teaspoon, that's his capacity. You know, there may be many little teaspoons, you know, among each other, and one has two drops of water, and one has three drops of water, and one has four drops, and one is saying, look at me, I have four drops, you only have one drop. Yes. And another says, I have six drops. <laughs> See how full I am. And another teaspoon, you know, has maybe 108 drops and he's completely full and everybody's like, <laughs> all, the, all the other teaspoons are envious of him. Some are accepting him as their guru. <laughs> or he must be God. But what is the capacity of a teaspoon to accommodate the entire Arabian Sea? Impossible. So similarly, what is our capacity with our little human intelligence, even the demigod of Brahma's intelligence, compared to Krishna, Brahma's powers and intelligence are not much different than ours. Compared to Krishna, Brahma's powers and intelligence is not much different than an ant. We think we're great compared to ants. Yes. But Brahma's like an ant comes to Krishna. So the limited can never comprehend the unlimited. It's beyond our scope infinitely behind our scope. But the quality of the unlimited can fully reveal himself to the limited. In this case, not only the Arabian Sea, but the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, the ocean of milk, the ocean of liquor, the ocean of sugarcane juice. <laughs> The ocean of ghee, all the oceans can fully fit in that teaspoon. That's what Achintya Shakti means. That's Krishna. So this is Brahma's realization. That unless if if Krishna reveals himself to us, to anyone then we can understand Krishna in full. But it's not by our 
it, it's not by how many rounds of japa we perform. It's not by how many times we have read through Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not by how many people we have converted to Krishna consciousness. It's not by how many people like our lectures or, our cure, or how many CDs we sell. <laughs> it's not by how much money we make. It's not by how much money we donate. It's not by my austerities how many years I've been following the regulative principles. It's not by how many um, praises I get from my own wife. It has nothing to do these are, only, these are only ways of somehow or other trying to please Krishna, some Siddhir Hari Toshana. If Krishna is pleased, Krishna reveals himself to us. In Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, we read about this little girl. She's only four years old. She's just sitting in the corner, minding her own business, and Lord Chaitanya turns to her in front of all these great Paramahamsa, Mahabhagavata, Acharyas. He turns to this little girl and he says, Narayani, chant Krishna's name and cry in ecstasy. So she's, she went, Krishna. Krishna. Torrents of tears were flowing from her eyes. Her hairs were standing on end. Her limbs were trembling. She fell to the ground in total ecstatic love of God, rolling on the ground, chanting Krishna's name constantly. And all of these great Vaishnavas, they understood this is the ultimate perfection of life. Yes, we must chant our rounds. We must study Srimad Bhagavatam. We must offer what we have to Krishna. If we don't do that, then there's no sincerity in our efforts. But unless it is done with the type of humility that Brahma is speaking about, it's not going to please Krishna. And we can do it birth after birth after birth and never get Krishna. And after describing how only bhakti can bring us to Krishna consciousness, Lord Brahma, he explains how um, his realization, even if the greatest scientists of the world, or even the great demigods, if you're able to count every Adam in the entire earth planet. Who could do that? Not just guess. <laughs> Who could even guess? How many atoms are there on the earth planet and in the earth planet? Even if you could actually have an authoritative number, counting every single atom in the earth. Even if you can understand every single snowflake that has ever fallen on earth. Now Himalaya means the abode of snow. I'm from Chicago. In the winter time, all you see is snow. In March of this year, April, it was April, yes, Maharaj? April in India, 
last, this is just this year earlier, I was here and it was just coming toward the end of April, March, just beginning of April, and it was so hot in India, so hot. Very intensely hot. And I was supposed to go on this tour of the Journey Home Book in, in Mas Moscow. So very, in the heat I was thinking, Moscow will be very refreshingly cool. So I was going for service, not for the cool. <laughs> But it's our nature, sometimes, even when we're going for service, you know, we'll take advantage of the coolness. While I, as long as it's there, I might as well be happy. Yes. So I went. And to get there was not easy. But when I did arrive, it was this deep of snow everywhere. And it was freezing cold. So freezing cold. You remember? This is April. And Sham Sundar Prabhu, who's here, he was in California. And these cellular phones, my God, they're just, they do so many things. They, um, he was sitting in a beautiful, sunny spring day in California. <laughs> And there was a peacock with his feathers opened, and he took a photo and sent it to me by phone. <laughs> he had no idea where I was. <laughs> Do you remember? It's a sunny day with flowering trees and a beautiful peacock smiling in the sunlight, and he said, I just wanted to share with you where I am, <laughs> Southern California. And he didn't know where I was. So I just was inside at the time, and I went, I just out the window, I took a photo and sent it to him. <laughs> it was total snow. And all the cars were buried in snow. And I sent it to him. I said, I just wanted to share with you where I am. <laughs> <laughs> to help him, help him appreciate where he was. And then... Bhaktivikyan Goswami Maharaj, who's with us today. He just, we had programs in Moscow. It was snowing the whole time, and there was snow everywhere. And then we decided to go to St. Petersburg. We took a train. And from Moscow all the way to St. Petersburg, all we saw was everything was just snow, as far as the eyes could see in the Russian countryside. Just snow, snow, and snow. Now, in America, when it's freezing and icy and snow just pouring down, pouring down, it was really heavy snow. To go to hear a Swami speak, people will just stay home. But every event was completely filled with people. And they're all not devotees, yes. Probably in some of these events, 80%, 90% were just common people, not devotees. But when they want to go somewhere, you know, the ice, the snow, the blizzards, the freezing cold, they just... I was thinking, these people are very special. But to get back to the Srimad Bhagavatam class, <laughs> Everything's relative. Brahma says every atom on earth, every flake of snow, even if you can count that, even if you can count 
every molecular particle on every ray emanating from the sun. You can count all those things, but still, it's impossible to count the unlimited divine qualities of Krishna. I'll read it specifically. In time, learned philosophers and scientists might be able to count all the atoms of the earth, the particles of snow, or perhaps even the shining molecules radiating from the sun, the stars and other luminaries. But among these learned men, who could possibly count the unlimited transcendental qualities possessed by you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who have descended onto the surface of the earth for the benefit of all living entities. You see, impersonal philosophers, because everything in this world is so limited and everything is subjected to deterioration and annihilation. They think for the absolute truth to be unlimited, the absolute truth must have no qualities. Nirguna, no qualities whatsoever. That's unlimited. But Brahma, he's saying that that type of analysis is simply mental speculation. Now that he has humbled himself and actually it has been revealed to him by Krishna's grace, he's explaining that Krishna has unlimited qualities. Unlimited doesn't mean no qualities. Unlimited means unlimited qualities. If you multiply by hundreds of trillions, the sum total of all the stars, all the snowflakes, all the atoms on earth, and all the molecular particles from the sunshine, add them all together and multiply it by quadrillions of quadrillions, and it doesn't add up to even a fraction of Krishna's unlimited quality. Now we may say that is impossible. This is some sort of poetic, spiritual stuff. But that's Krishna. He's a chintya. He's inconceivable. And the most inconceivable potency of Krishna is his ladini shakti, his pleasure potency. Because that pleasure potency conquers him. And Brahma goes on to explain that although Krishna is so great, he agrees to become subordinate, controlled, and conquered by the love of his devotee. This little infinitesimal jiva this little part and parcel of Krishna that's you and me. When it is purified through devotion and when that Ananda Shakti awakens within our heart by Radha's grace, then Krishna is conquered by that love. How could Mother Yashoda put a rope around him? How could the little cowherd boys defeat him in wrestling? How could Krishna tell the gopis that even in the entire lifespan of Brahma, I can never repay you for your love for me? That's Krishna. That's Vrindavan. This is what Brahma is beginning to understand. Brahma tells Tatena Kampam Susamikshamano Bunjana Ivat Mikritam Vipakam Ridvagvapur Vir Vidadam Namaste Jiveti Mukti Padesa Daya Bhak. 
My dear Lord, <clears throat> one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. Srila Prabhupada quoted this verse very often because it's so relevant to each and every one of us. In this world, dukkalayam ashashvatam, there will be tribulation, reversals, sufferings. Whether you're a devotee or whether you're not a devotee, those things do not change, not much. Being a devotee means you transcend it. Being a devotee doesn't mean that now I will not grow old. Now I will not get diseased. Now I will not die. That's true about the soul, but the soul's always like that. But it doesn't mean your body is be going to become some immortal deity. Everything in matter. Even Brahma dies eventually. So devotional service means we transcend the dualities of material existence. We realize the immortality of the soul. And we realize the love of Krishna in every aspect of our life. But in the process, the way to actually achieve Krishna's grace is so beautifully explained in this verse. That with a heart of gratitude, love and respect, we go on serving Krishna whatever happens. Thams the Tikshashwabharata. We tolerate all these inconveniences. And we also tolerate the conveniences. A devotee tolerates pleasure because pleasure can really divert our attention away from Krishna. And a dev devotee tolerates pain because pain could easily divert our attention away from Krishna. Just a few days ago, a wonderful devotee passed from this world. He was the son of one of my god sisters. In Italy, there's a lady named Chitra Rupini Devi, one of Srila Prabhupada's very dear disciples. And what a wonderful devotee she is loves to serve, always humble, offers respects to everyone. And she was a single mother raising her child, perfectly f chaste, faithful, even despite, you know, just having to raise one child all alone. And how she raised this child her one and only. Her example inspired him in such a way. He was born a devotee, and when he became a teenager, when most teenagers are very enthusiastic about discovering the inner secrets of material nature, they go into and the society of being cool, not like in Moscow, <laughs> but being cool by just making the scene and being able to attract the opposite sex and enjoying. When he was just about 16 years old, 17 years old, 
didn't want anything but to serve. He was chanting 16 rounds every day, minimal, eager to serve devotees, eager to serve everyone. He was just the pride and joy of his mother, you could imagine. He was incredible. You know, Maya just was tempting him as much as anyone else, but he just turned his head around and said, I want Krishna. He was so loving, so devotional. And when he was about 20, he got cancer. Some kind of lymph cancer. And the poor boy, 20 years old, wonderful devotee, very pure devotee, never making any offenses to anyone. Just loves to chant, loves to dance, loves to serve, loves to associate. And he went through six months. Is chemotherapy six months or one year? He went through one year of chemotherapy. The entire, and they tested him, and he still had the cancer. So the doctor said, you have to go through another year with double dose. He went through that. You know how much suffering, how, how debilitating that is? Still didn't still didn't work. And his mother was so much trying to help him, all she had. So the doctor said, the only possibility is we have to transplant bone marrow from somebody into him. So she volunteered it herself. I imagine it's quite painful. She did the whole surgery and she donated her bone marrow for him. But through all this, through, through both um, treatments of chemotherapy, through the surgeries, through all these other different ways they were trying, whenever I would come to Italy, he would always come to see me without doubt. And he was always just offering his... And in, Nobody ever heard him complain. The only complaint was, I want to serve. I have no strength to serve. I'm not able to concentrate on my chanting my rounds. I'm not able to help the devotees. You know, Rathayatra is coming and they need so much help and I can't help. That was his only, his only complaint. And it wasn't even a complaint. He was just feeling such separation from service. It wasn't about the pain. It wasn't about maybe I'll die. It's just about, I want to serve so bad. Just a few days ago, his mother called and told me that he was, he was at very last stages. So I sp spoke to him on the phone and I chanted for him. And devotees gathered around him and were having little kirtan and his mother was praying. And he passed from the world. Devotees may ask, why did it happen to him? All these teenagers who are, you know, getting intoxicated and doing all kinds of other things that, you know, they're healthy and strong and living long. Why did this happen to him? Of course, people like that also get cancer and go through it. We had the same discussions when those eight wonderful, loving devotees 
left us in that plane crash in the Himalayas earlier this year. The nature of material existence is whoever we are. There's going to be sufferings, there's going to be obstacles, because that's the nature of the material body. Especially on this earth planet. But here Lord Brahma is telling us, and this boy Madhavananda Prabhu, he very much exemplified this, this verse. He passed away, he was only 22 years old. That Krishna, even when, Brahma is saying, even when all sorts of sufferings and difficulties come upon us, if we're able, with a grateful and humble heart and folded hands, say, Krishna, thank you. I'm yours. If you do that, you will go back to Godhead. You will attain the supreme perfection of liberation. Going back to Godhead. If you can't do that, then you're likely to keep coming back until you can. So Brahma, he's, he's an authority. He was an authority before he had this darshan of Krishna, but now he's in his peak of wisdom. And he's giving us this verse. It's not about how much you accomplish on the worldly level. It's not about how much you know. It's not about how how good your body is. Even if you can do every single asana in Patanj Patanjali's Yoga Sutras expertly. Or you could stand on one finger with your feet going backward, covering your eyes. <laughs> without moving and without breathing for 108 days. Still, you can't go back to Godhead by doing that. But if when the challenges and struggles and anything else that come in life, if you just continue to chant the holy names, continue to offer your prayers with a respectful, humble, and grateful heart, then you will go back to God. Brahma says, then he starts um, my lord, just see my in uncivilized impudence. This is pretty incredible. Now Brahma's an, a liberated soul. He's actually seeing Vrindavan as it is. He's seeing Krishna as he is. He's received the grace of the Lord. And he's not talking about what a great devotee he is. He's talking about what an impudent, uncivilized person he is. And he's begging of, to be excused for his offenses. I, I have taken birth in the mode of passion and I'm therefore simply foolish presuming myself a controller independent of your lordship. My eyes are blinded by the darkness of ignorance, which causes me to think of myself as the unborn creator of the universe. But please consider that I am your servant and therefore worthy of your compassion. Such a birth of Brahma. Sometimes people ask, who is your mother? 
How many have been asked that question? Who is your father? Well, when they ask Brahma that question, how many of you could say, I was born on a fragrant, beautiful, thousand-petal lotus flower that sprouted from the navel of Garbhodakshayi Vishnu? Hmm? That's quite sensationalistic. That's Brahma's birth. But after this incident, where because of his high birth and his power and his influence, all the, de all the demigods honor Brahma. And nobody could steal his post. He is Brahma for the whole universe. As long as this universe exists, there's the same Brahma. Yes? He doesn't have to campaign. <laughs> for votes every four years, even every four kalpas. <laughs> Secure. Such a person. But Lord Brahma, he prayed to Krishna that I want to be born in an untouchable family where people will persecute me and ridicule me. <clears throat> then I'll really be able to chant your names. So Lord Krishna fulfilled his desire. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya appeared to Brahma and said, in Antardweep, he knew Lord Chaitanya would be coming, but he knew how he made mistakes to Krishna because of his powerful position. So he did tapasya. When Lord Chaitanya appeared, he said, I don't want to, I don't want to have any pride. So the Lord said, all right, you will be an untouchable. And you will be persecuted and ridiculed and misunderstood in every aspect of your life. But in that state, you will always be humbly chanting my names. And Lord Brahma came as Haridas Thakur. Well, materialistic people condemned him. The Supreme Personality of God had Lord Chaitanya. He would say, I am touching you for my purification. Your birth is better than mine. And when Haridas passed away, Lord Chaitanya danced with his body. And with tears in his eyes, he declared, the crown jewel of the whole universe has left us. This is to the extent that this kind of humility and devotion affects Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes, Sri Dhamma Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, thank you very much for the wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, <coughs> just one serious uh, concern that comes to my mind every time I hear such uh, amazing st stories about devotees uh, behaving in most devotional ways in their uh, very difficult situations. Uh, what, what I find very difficult to uh, understand is that the devotee has gone through his situations and he has passed away in a glorious way going back to Krishna. But uh, the people who remain back, they really suffer. So how, do, how, how does somebody who, we really don't, I mean, we, we, we really don't uh, honor the people who stay back because they are really suffering. The people who 
when they have gone back to the higher realms. So how do people like uh, who were staying back and were suffering their, I would say, use the word separation from these people who have left? Uh, how do we? I mean, how how do we this situation? Because for them it is a very cruel situation. Even though the person is glorified, but it appears to be very cruel. The principle of this verse applies to every type of suffering in this world. It may be the suffering of our own body and mind. It may be the suffering of the loss of loved ones. And in this case, Chitarubini Devi, she's not complaining. She did everything. She dedicated the last three years, 24 hours a day, to try to help her child. It's, for her, it's on our level of humans. It's like Sachi Mata when Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. He was gone. But, She's just taking it in such, she's responding with such Krishna consciousness. Just grateful for the, whatever service she had to such a wonderful soul who appeared as her son. And the pain is intense, the separation, the motherly affection. But her gratitude for Krishna, her sincerity in taking shelter of the holy name is not is not being distracted by these things. And Madhavananda Prabhu, he had his challenges to maintain the integrity of this verse. And his mother is having her challenges to maintain the integrity of this verse. And each and every one of us as devotees, have our own challenges to maintain the integrity of this verse. And to have sympathy to help each other to maintain that integrity is a very sacred and essential aspect of our own Krishna consciousness. What does it mean to be the servant of the servant of the servant? It means to be there for each, that our service to each other is intact even through the various challenges and crises that inevitable come. But oftentimes, it's the nice things of this world that distract us even more. Temptations, opportunities for power, for pleasure, for mystic perfections. So these dualities we, we remain very, very steady and dedicated to our spiritual practice and to the integrity of service, whatever may come. Honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain, health, disease, success, failure. We just carry on with, with grateful hearts chanting Hare Krishna and serving each other. That's the path of perfection. And according to Brahma, that's the only path of perfection. Does that answer your question? Marjorie and Joe, my sincerest love, my prayers, my gratitude, my hoping that all 
Krishna's blessing shower upon you, good health and happiness. Thank you very much. Now all of the devotees, please greet Joe and Marjorie by loudly saying, <laughs> he don't show his opulence. In, and in Vrindavan, there is a Maya which covers the knowledge that Krishna is the supreme, supreme personality of Godhead and he is the father of everyone and everyone is the eternal servant of Krishna. Then even after this, why the Vasis of Vrindavan, they are constantly eager to serve the Lord. They are completely surrendered to the Lord. They love so much with the Lord. That is the nature of that supreme, all-inclusive prem or love. They understand Krishna's supremacy better than anyone. But their love is so deep and so intimate that that his sweetness is so great that even though fully understanding his supremacy and his powers and his opulences, it becomes insignificant compared to his sweetness, his beauty, and his playful pastimes. That is the special feature of the love of the residents of Vrindava. That's what Brahma has understood through this beautiful pastime. In Brahma Loka, when Brahma performs yajyas, Vishnu appears to receive his, yag- his offerings. But even the opulences of Vishnu become insignificant in, compar- in comparison to the sweetness of Krishna. And it's not that there's a competition because he's the same person. Vishnu and Krishna are identical, one person. But as Krishna, he reveals his highest, deepest opulence of Madhurya Ras in Vrindavan. Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. This Hare Krishna mantra has descended not from Vaikuntha but from Goloka Vrindavan to bring us to that destination. So let us chant and be grateful and happy. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.